It's nice, and there's not a good reason. Um, anyways, I will get started because I think that I want to make a lot of time, if possible, for discussion and uh, interest. And so it's really a great privilege and a pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Ron Wald. And he's a nephrologist at St. Michael's Hospital, but serves as the medical director of the dialysis unit as well. He's an associate professor of medicine uh, and health policy management and evaluation at U of T. Um, he's from Montreal originally and did his training uh, at McGill in, the, in internal medicine and then went to the University of Toronto and did his research training at Tufts in the U.S. And so he's worked with a number of people uh, that we also, uh, that many of you will know familiar from the literature, Glenn Chertow, Andy Levy and various others. And he uh, has been just finishing a number of large clinical trials and is really one of the nephrology clinical trialists in Canada, especially in the dialysis sphere. There's one in acute kidney injury called START-AKI, which uh, has just finished enrollment, and uh, he's been part of the Canadian Nephrology Trials Network um, and really has a presence and has helped us as a group of nephrologists uh, in the world actually have a presence in the AKI and the dialysis world. And so there's a lot of controversy in the area of phosphate. Um, and so I was really thrilled uh, knowing A, that there's a study pending, and B, that he was willing to come out here on a Friday to talk to us about phosphate control and dialysis and some opportunities for uh, studies. So uh, Ron, welcome and uh, looking forward to it. So thank you, Adira, for the uh, kind and warm introduction. It's always uh, great to be in this uh, beautiful city, and uh, thank you again for uh, coming out uh, so early on, uh, on a Friday morning uh, to hear my talk. So I want to uh, start uh, perhaps with a, uh, a bit of a kind of clinical uh, question, a bit of a clinical challenge, if you will. So um, you're doing monthly blood work rounds in your hemodialysis unit, a uh, 65-year-old man on dialysis because of uh, GN, he's on a conventional dialysis schedule, his past medical history is only remarkable otherwise for gout, he's listed for transplant, his calcium is 2.2, his phosphate is 2.3, PTH is 42, and he's currently receiving as part of his phosphate binding regimen about two and a half grams of elemental calcium per day um, in the form of calcium carbonate. So question, are you satisfied with his phosphate control? Or do you attempt to make a change? Okay, All for, just for consideration. And if not, how would you modify a therapy? Okay, just a thought. I'll let you think about that. So, uh, a second scenario: 46-year-old woman um, on dialysis due to di uh, diabetic kidney disease. Uh, she has a past medical history of coronary artery disease and hypertension. Calcium is 2.35. Phosphate is 1.3 within the normal range. PTH is 60. She's receiving three grams of elemental calcium per day as part of her phosphate binding regimen. But on top of that, someone has already also escalated that and added Sevelmer 800 milligrams TID. She comes up to you and she says, you know what, I am really upset about all the tablets that I'm taking, particularly for my phosphate binding. It's just too much, doctor. And so the question is, what do you do in response to that? Do you convince her, do you attempt to convince her at least, that achievement, the successful achievement of this awesome phosphate value is worth all that pill burden. Okay. So for today, I hope to uh, maybe review, not, 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 not necessarily to describe de novo, but to review for this audience the rationale for intensive phosphate lowering in the dialysis population, to talk about some of the design challenges that we have had uh, in working towards a trial comparing two different uh, phosphate control targets in patients receiving maintenance dialysis, and finally tell you a little bit about the uh, target phosphate uh, research uh, program. So what is the big deal about phosphate? I think anyone in this room won't be surprised by these provocative headlines that we sometimes see in the nephrology literature. Phosphate's a poison for humans. Um, phosphate's a killer among us, is lurking killer among us. And these aren't just kind of attention-grabbing headlines. The philosophy underlining these um, titles or headlines actually affect the way we practice. These uh, concepts have filtered down to the way that we treat our patients. And the question that we have to ask today, is that appropriate? Well, normally the pathway towards knowledge generation in medicine often starts in the basic science labs. It moves on to observational data to generate hypotheses, then to good randomized trials, and ultimately to the generation of 
clinical practice guidelines, what we call knowledge translation, and then ultimately clinical uptake. And the question that I pose to you today is, have we gone through this sequence in the care of our patients when it comes to their serum phosphate control? So a few words, I'm not a basic scientist by any means, but I think it's always great to talk about where this concept of phosphate being a killer comes from. It comes from an amazing group of basic scientists and a very rich body of research that I'll attempt to describe in a couple of slides. Um, so this is a, a study by uh, Jono and colleagues. They took human aortic smooth muscle cells and incubated them in different uh, phosphate concentration, uh, different media containing different uh, phosphate uh, concentrations. And so in the uh, dotted line, you have uh, these smooth muscle cells that were incubated in phosphate concentrations of 1.4 millimole per liter, so-called normal phosphate. And over time, over a period of nine days, they didn't really, there was no increase in calcium deposition. I should also say that they gave the cells uh, a medium uh, that was full of calcium. But you didn't see much actual calcification occurring within the cells. But in, in the cells that were exposed to a phosphate medium of two millimoles per liter, what we call hyperphosphate, a hyperphosphatemic environment, we saw a gradual increase in vascular calcification in the vicinity of these cells. Um, and this was a dose, uh, this was responsive to dose. As you gradually go up in, in phosphate concentration, um, the degree of calcification in these smooth muscle cells increased. And um, it, what's really fascinating about it is they demonstrated how um, using a uh, sodium phosphate um, uh, co -trans uh, transporter, uh, you had the uptake of the phosphate into the cells, inducing uh, the transcription factors that um, guide calcification and the upregulation of genes that would normally be seen in bone. So effectively, this calcification is all about phosphate turning smooth muscle cells, which should not be calcifying organs, into osteogenic um, tissue. And there are other, you know, really interesting lines of research that have uh, described this. Uh, we have data showing that hyperphosphatemia induces vascular smooth muscle apoptos cell apoptosis, vascular inflammation, endothelial dysfunction is generated by hyperphosphatemia, and hyperphosphatemia even generate or cause left ventricular hypertrophy, which we know is so prevalent in our uh, population. And even beyond the cardiovascular system, we know that phosphate can have adverse effects on residual kidney function. It can have direct cellular effects in other organs. It can cause muscle, muscle uh, atrophy. So phosphate is, has seemingly, at least based on the basic science data, has pleiotropic adverse uh, effects. So overall, going back to this kind of pathway towards knowledge generation in medicine, we definitely have a good body of basic science experimentation showing that hyperphosphatemia is bad for you, and particularly bad for the cardiovascular system. Now let's move to observational data. And here I come back to a very local but very important study published 15 years ago. Uh, but it was really an important study um, by Adira and her group and Leslie Stevens, I guess, when she was a fellow here, that because it was the first population-wide study of the, that tried to examine the impact of mineral metabolic parameters on clinical outcomes. Look at the entirety of the BC dialysis population at the time, 515 patients who were on dialysis as of January 2000. They looked at their mineral metabolic parameters for the first quarter of 2000 and followed them for two years. Hyperphosphatemia was an independent, very potent risk factor for mortality, but a 50% increase in the risk of death adjusted for all important comorbidities and demographic factors for every millimole per liter increase in your serum phosphate. But importantly, if that hyperphosphatemia, defined as a phosphate of about over 1.8 or so, when it was combined with hypercalcemia, you kind of had a synergistic effect and about a fourfold increase in mortality was evident. And this was really, I must say, I'm not, not just to say so here, this was truly a pioneering study because we didn't appreciate these concepts very well at the time. At around the same time, Jeff Block and colleagues looked at the Fresenius database and um, you can see the different categories of uh, serum phosphate uh, on the x-axis, and I'll turn your attention to, in every phosphate category to the most rightward um, uh, kind of plot that shows the multi-variable adjusted uh, relative risk, and you can see that as phosphate goes up above, certainly above two millimoles per liter, you have a graded increase uh, 
in the risk of death over a two-year period. Again, this was a cohort of 40,000 dialysis patients um, from the late 90s. When I was a fellow in uh, Boston at Tufts, I was fortunate to work with um, some of the investigators from the HEMO trial, so a huge, uh, relatively rich uh, database of information about hemodialysis patients, about 1,800 hemodialysis patients. And we were interested in understanding, you know, what effect, we know that phosphate as a one-time measure is associated with death, but in reality, phosphate and all mineral met metabolic parameters change over time, and they may have cumulative effects over time. Is it the immediate phosphate elevation that causes these bad things, or is it kind of phosphate over time? And um, in a nutshell, in the hemo cohort, we showed that when phosphate rose to above 2 millimole per liter, where you look at it as a baseline value, as a time-dependent covariate, or even as a running mean, a cumulative phosphate concentration over time, there was about a 30% increase in the risk of death for every um, millimole per liter increase in the serum phosphate concentration. Um, there have been many other studies since that time looking at the relationships between serum phosphate and other mineral metabolic parameters and um, cardiovascular outcomes and ultimately mortality. So Tonya Palmer from New Zealand put this all together in a beautiful meta-analysis published uh, in JAMA in 2011. So the bottom line was that for every one milligram per deciliter, that's the U.S. unit, 0.3 millimoles per liter of phosphate approximately, increase in your serum phosphate, you have an 18 percent or so increase in the risk of all-cause mortality. And when you focus just on cardiovascular uh, mortality, there's about a 10 percent increase for every milligram per deciliter increase in serum phosphate. So a very compelling body of observational data linking phosphate with adverse events. So here we go back to kind of the classic discussion we always have at Journal Club. Is this relationship associative or is it actually causal, which would be the latter is what we're really more interested in. And I think we can certainly make an argument perhaps for both. Phosphates, of course, can be associated with adverse outcomes, but in reality we know that absenteeism or truncation of dialysis session time, uh, non-adherence to medications, non-adherence to diet, and maybe other unmeasurable factors might all be linked with phosphate and also or be correlated with phosphate and also themselves mediate adverse outcomes. So is it really phosphate driving these adverse outcomes or is it really all the other things that kind of co-populate with hyperphosphatemia? But we can also go back to the basic science literature that I showed you in very rudimentary terms and make a very strong argument for how phosphate could actually mediate adverse cardiovascular events. But at the end of the day, if the relationship between hyperphosphatemia and adverse events is truly causal, you would have to expect, or the burden would be on us, to prove that lowering the serum phosphate concentration would actually reduce mortality and other adverse events. And so the natural next step, based on the sequence that I showed you earlier, would be a definitive clinical trial testing the effect of the intentional lowering of serum phosphate. We can discuss how we do it later on. That's a whole other debate. But that in, has not been done, at least to date. Despite that fact, despite the absence of good evidence to show you know, the, the importance uh, or the uh, true definitive nature of phosphate lowering on patient-related events, that has not deterred guideline committees in our profession to aggressively recommend the reduction or the normalization of hyperphosphatemia. The KDIGO guidelines, probably the, the most widely accepted clinical practice guidelines we have in nephrology. This is the 2009 guidelines. They were confirmed or they were reiterated, if you will, in their update in 2017. They stated that in patients with chronic kidney disease, stage 5 DV suggest lowering elevated phosphorus levels toward the target range. And let's be clear what, what we consider normal or the, the normal range um, that would be a phosphate approximately 0.8 to 1.5 millimoles per liter measured pre-dialysis. Just, I don't think we all know that, but I want to be very clear about what we're talking about when we talk about phosphate concentration. And despite the fact that we have no trials in this area, we have a disproportional number of clinical practice guidelines that want to make a comment on this. So it's not just paid to go uh, but also the Australians, the, the, the Brits, and of course our Canadian Society of Nephrology have more or less said the same thing, that hyperphosphatemia lowering is a good thing, it's a thing to do in patients receiving maintenance dialysis. 
So I call this the so-called the great phosphate bypass. We have basic science experimentation showing hyperphosphatemia is bad. We have observational data showing the same thing. But we forgot to do the randomized trials. We've jumped right to the clinical practice guidelines. And it's not just clinical practice guidelines. This is actually how we practice. These guidelines do influence what we do. Uh, and even if those of us who might be more or less skeptical about the dangers of hyperphosphatemia, to some extent, we all look at phosphate. We all deal with phosphate. We own it. And let's talk about how we can get ourselves, you know, to how we can provide more information to inform practice. So let's talk a little bit about how phosphate normalization, which is ultimately the goal of these clinical practice guidelines, how that's achieved in our clinical practice. So it's kind of the three pillars we all know about. It's about diet, it's about dialysis, intensification, and it's about binders. But I want to, what I want to really focus on today is how our patients feel about each of these interventions to normalize phosphate. Let's talk a little bit about dietary phosphate restriction. So um, we know that there are some aspects of phosphate restriction that are probably good for patients. Phosphate uh, is contained in a, a variety of, uh, as an additive in a variety of products, and uh, avoiding those additives is probably good for other uh, health, good healthy diet um, reasons and, and ma maintaining a, a good healthy diet. So that's probably not a big deal. But we also know that phosphate is in a lot of healthy things, in uh, protein-containing foods in particular, and restricting phosphate in the context, in, in an aggressive way at least, may not be in the patient's best interest. And in fact, there is no evidence that dietary phosphate restriction confers better outcomes. Actually, there's some data from the HEMO trial showing quite the opposite. But importantly, how do patients feel about restricting their diet for phosphate and for other um, you know, things that we tell them to do uh, when it comes to the renal, so-called renal diet? So here I want to bring to your attention um, a really important uh, body of work led by Braden Men uh, and Benda Hemelgarn and Andreas Lopakis, who works at my hospital at St. Mike's. And it was uh, an important meeting that took place now about six years ago that brought together patients, caregivers, clinicians from across Canada to kind of, in a um, collaborative way, establish a prior research priorities in dialysis. And it was an iterative process that involved kind of screening through hundreds, maybe even thousands, of potential research questions. And this group got together and collaboratively said, these are the issues that we think are the most important for study, at least when it comes to dialysis. And question number seven, number seven out of 10 on this list of priorities, was the following. For patients with kidney failure, what is the effect of each of the dietary restrictions, sodium, potassium, and phosphate, and when taken in combination on important outcomes, including quality of life. This is something that was really a top priority for our patients. And the key themes that came out of the discussion were as follows. You know, patients wanted to know what are the benefits associated with dietary restriction? Does adherence to a renal diet really improve health outcomes? And most importantly, they wanted to know, are these dietary restrictions, could these be relaxed in some way? Can't we get ease, go easy on us? Can't you go easy on us? because they really are impacting our quality of life in an adverse way. Pillar number two of the phosphate lowering uh, triad, dialysis intensification. So again, to clarify, we're talking about patients who are receiving 12 hours per week conventional hemodialysis. They're not achieving phosphate targets. You can certainly consider intensifying their dialysis regimen either with short daily hemodialysis, with uh, home nocturnal, all mo modalities of dialysis, dialysis schedules that definitely improve phosphate control. We know that very well from the literature. There's no better way of normalizing phosphate consistently than with more dialysis. Um, and the nice thing about intensifying dialysis is there may be benefits in terms of quality of life, dietary liberalization and other domains, as well as cardiovascular health, perhaps. But again, we have to ask ourselves very honestly, would we actually ask a patient to intensify or radically change their life by intensifying their dialysis regimen in order to achieve a better control of their serum phosphate? So again, going back to uh, Braden's study and the top 10 research priorities, we asked how do patients actually feel about dialysis intensification? And question number two on that list of priorities was as follows. How do different dialysis modalities compare in terms of their effect on quality of life, mortality, 
and patient acceptability? And are there specific patient factors that make one modality more advantageous compared to another? But a key theme that was expressed by patients, and, and, I, and I think this truly does jive with what patients tell me at the bedside when I ask them to consider intensifying their dialysis regimen, maybe not for foster, but for other reasons, they're very uncertain about the optimal length of time of dialysis session, or even how frequently they need to come for dialysis. And they want to know, patients want to know whether outcomes and quality of life can be maintained or maybe improved with shorter hemodialysis sessions. So maybe we as a nephrology community is, are very interested in intensifying dialysis for phosphate and other reasons, but our patients are not necessarily interested in that. And we have, a, as I know you do too here as well, uh, a great uh, hope, a nocturnal uh, in-center dialysis program. We are having trouble. We have a decent you know, cohort of patients, but in general, most patients don't opt in. They want to come for the minimal amount of time that is feasible, and that is it. So when you talk about phosphate um, uh, control and intensifying dialysis, I think we have to be very cognizant of patients' concerns about that. Which brings us ultimately to the third pillar of uh, phosphate control, which are phosphate binders. And because the vast majority of patients are on conventional dialysis regimens, and because dietary, uh, even a well-adhered um, to diet, does not lead to a phosphate balance uh, in our population, um, almost all our patients need phosphate binders. Binders are prescribed to well over 80% of prevalent dialysis recipients, depending on what study you look at. Um, all binder classes are effective in their own ways at lowering serum phosphate. But the question that really matters when it comes to binders is do these binders alter outcomes that matter to patients? So Suetonia Palmer, again um, from New Zealand and her group, uh, did what's called a network meta-analysis, comparing all the trials that either compared binder to placebo or different binders to each other. Um, and in a nutshell, it was a massive work comp comprising 77 randomized controlled trials, 12,000 patients with CKD, almost all of whom were on dialysis. Some studies were conducted in patients who were pre-dialysis. The median duration of these trials was three months, okay, three months. We're giving these drugs to patients for basically the entirety of their lives or until they get a transplant, but these trials were conducted for a median of three months. Most trials were small, had a very high risk of bias. And in a nutshell, um, you have this uh, really nice table comparing different binder strategies to each other, but I really want to draw your attention to the, to the last row uh, on this table, which is a kind of a, a matrix that compares each of the different binder classes to placebo. There were a few studies done that compared um, binder to placebo, and you can see that the, um, the effect estimates are very wide. There's a lot of imprecision in these studies, but ultimately there is no data from randomized trials showing that phosphate binders reduce the risk of death in patients with chronic kidney disease, most of whom, again, in, this, in these studies were on dialysis. And then you have to ask the question, how do patients feel about binders? This is going to come as no surprise to you. We know that adherence to binders is, at best, sometimes variable. Uh, patients do not like the high pill burden it associates with a poor quality of life. And in a recent um, kind of um, Australia-wide uh, meeting uh, that brought together, kind of like in the Canadian um, study that I described earlier, patients and caregivers and, their lo and, and, and clinicians, polypharmacy was the top concern for hemodialysis patients. They, and you, the top question of concern in that survey was, what is the best way to make tablet regimes simpler? So again, as we escalate tablet regimes as part of phosphate binding, patients are not interested in that. They want simple Effect, effective, certainly, but they want simpler um, uh, pharmaceutical regimens. Let's talk a little bit about the financial impact of phosphate binders. So phosphate binders cost the American healthcare system, this is data from a few years ago, $1.5 billion. Um, and uh, what Wendy St. Peter and colleagues showed was that the cost of binders was escalating disproportionately compared to other um, uh, agents or, or interventions done for patients with end-stage kidney disease on dialysis. The cost of binders is rising. Now, I should say that in Canada, I'm not sure that we can directly extrapolate these data, even with the 10% rule, because um, our use of non-calcium-based uh, binders is uh, relatively limited in most jurisdictions, so I'm not sure these data apply to the Canadian context. But another cost that I want to emphasize that applies to Canada is the cost of the time 
bent on dealing with fear and fostering, not just by physicians and nephrologists, by nurse practitioners, by dietitians, by social workers who are trying to secure funding, by pharmacists who are trying to ensure that uh, the right phosphate binders are available to patients. So we do spend a lot of time, that may be hard to quantify and put into dollar terms, but we definitely spend a lot of time uh, on phosphate binding. And so in an editorial on the uh, cost paper that I alluded to, Brian Kessenbaum from just south of here in Seattle um, you know, uh, wrote a really compelling piece. And Brian has been one of the leaders um, in the American nephrology community writing about the potential toxicity of phosphate over the years. But he asked a really fundamental question, I think it's hopefully on all of our minds, is how can a medication class achieve 75% prevalence of use in a chronic disease population without evidence, without evidence, of clinical benefit. So again, how, let's, let's kind of do a bit of introspection um, as nephrologists. How did we get here? A bit of counseling for us. Uh, um, you know, so I think that a lot of it is ultimately very well-meaning. I think there's a general belief among nephrology kidney clinicians that hyperphosphatemia is toxic to patients. We saw the experimental data. We saw the observational data. And because there are no randomized trials, we still want to do what's best for our patients. And that's totally legitimate. We are not bad people. We mean well. We really do mean well. But what is problematic, and this is where I get a little bit um, um, excited, yes, I want to say, um, is not the fact that, because we all have to have belief, not everything we do in clinical practice can be based on clinical trials. We have to make decisions for our patients sometimes on inadequate evidence. And that's okay for phosphate too. But what does bug me is a dogmatic unwillingness of some clinicians to be willing to even test the hypothesis that phosphate lowering improves patient outcome. You can believe that hyperphosphatemia is bad, but I have more difficulty if you tell me that I'm not even willing to test it because I am so sure that that is true. And in an editorial written a few years ago um, by you know, eminent uh, you know, key opinion leaders in this field, you know, one of the comments was, from an ethical ed emphasis added by me point of view, it appears impossible to leave dialysis patients with hyperphosphatemia on placebo treatment for prolonged periods of time. Really? We really believe this is true. Another reason I think we've gotten to this point and, uh, is the fact that, to some extent, we've let industry and big pharma drive the research agenda in nephrology. And there's a lot of legitimate reasons for that. Certainly pharma has brought a lot of good innovation to, uh, to nephrology. But it's fair to say that if you um, are a pharmaceutical company that owns the rights to a phosphate binder and the regulatory authorities are willing to approve that product based on surrogate outcomes, namely you can show that your product lowers phosphate, very nice, your product's on the market, why would you even want to support a trial that addresses whether phosphate lowering is even good. So when we approached pharma for our trial program over the years, their answer was a very polite and sometimes impolite no. Because uh, why would they? Why would they want to support anything that questions the fundamental tenet of hyperphosphatemia being toxic? So as, where I'm going here is I think we do need to go towards a clinical trial in this area. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how we've kind of gotten there and what we're doing now on that uh, road. So before we embark on a large-scale clinical trial, before we ask CIHR or other large funding authorities for um, you know, significant amounts of money to fund such a trial, we really have to answer, is this feasible? Is this even possible? Will clinicians, given all that I've said before, agree to participate? Will patients who perhaps have been influenced by years of hearing propaganda about phosphate Will they be willing to participate and go into kind of a high phosphate arm or a phosphate liberalized arm? How will phosphate concentrations be managed in these trials? Will patients adhere? Can we assure adequate fault? These are fundamental questions that you've got to sort out before you embark on a large clinical trial. And that's really where pilot uh, RCTs are really important. And we were lucky enough a few years ago to get funded by CIHR and in partnership with my uh, co-PI and good friend in Hamilton, Michael Walsh, uh, we got wonderful colleagues across Canada together to do a very modest uh, pilot RCT to really address these feasibility questions. We called it TARGET. Um, Mike came up with that acronym. It's kind of a very loose um, acronym like many are. Two phosphate targets and end-stage renal disease trial. So it kind of works for the acronym, kind of awkward how we get there. Um, but the objectives of TARGET were 
really very simple. We wanted to evaluate the feasibility of conducting a randomized controlled trial of what we call intensive versus liberalized phosphate control in hemodialysis recipients. And the main, the primary outcome was designed around whether we can demonstrate a meaningful separation in the serum phosphate concentration between those patients uh, allocated to intensive control as compared to those allocated to liberalized control over a very modest 26-week follow-up period. Um, Target was an open-label RCT conducted at five academic health sciences centers in Canada, in Calgary, Toronto, London, Hamilton, and Halifax. Um, we included individuals who were uh, over 18 on hemodialysis for over 90 days who weren't getting what we call crazily intense dialysis regimens less than 16 hours per week. Was kind of that, that was kind of the upper threshold of what we'd accept because we figured that people who were getting more than that phosphate control probably wouldn't be such a big issue. We wanted patients to have phosphate concentrations between 1.3 and 2.5 at baseline. So we figured if they were too low, there was really no issue with phosphate control. If they were too high, they were probably not adherent. And no matter what we did, if they got into the intensive arm, they would never get to the intensive target. Um, they had to be in receipt of a calcium-based phosphate binder because that's the only binder that was really readily available at all of the trial sites and the only, frankly, the only binder we could afford as a research team, going back to what I said earlier about pharma not willing uh, to support us. And they had to be taking no more than three grams per day of elemental calcium. Almost always it was calcium carbonate. Um, the exclusions, uh, if the patients were scheduled for a live donor transplant or if they were switching to home hemo, or to uh, PD in the next six months if the patients were pregnant, uh, if they already were hypercalcemic in the last eight weeks, and necessitating a change in their calcium dose, if they had a history of calciphylaxis, or if the nephrologist fundamentally disagreed with the trial and the concept, at least for that patient, of letting the research team manage, and manage the patient's phosphate based on the arm to which the patient was allocated. So at the end, the nephrologist had like what I call veto power. It was not exercised for the most part in this pilot, which was an important finding in and of itself. Uh, in the intensive arm, basically our goal was to mimic or do what the guidelines tell us to do, which is to normalize phosphate, aim for a phosphate concentration of less than 1.5, and we did so by titrating calcium carbonate up to a dose, maximal dose of 3 grams uh, per day uh, using, using an algorithm that we developed for the trial, uh, as well as complementing it with the help of our dietitian with good advice about phosphate restriction in patients' diet. In the liberalized arm, essentially what we did was a structured weaning of phosphate binders, um, and we only uh, allowed for what we called rescue phosphate binding if the serum phosphate exceeded what we call the alarm threshold of 2.5 millimoles uh, per liter. Dietitians, of course, were available for counseling about de general dietary issues, but we told the dietitians, please don't talk to these patients about phosphate. Just don't talk about it for six months unless it goes over, unless phosphate goes to the 2.5, which it did very infrequently, happily. Calcium carbonate, the most commonly used phosphate binder in Canada, was supplied freely to all patients, uh, and it was a very small part of our budget. Uh, we gave patients the choice. You could take the, the pill form, 1,250 milligrams of calcium carbonate, or we provided the chewable form in, in the form of Tums Extra Strength if that was the patient's preference. Um, and patients who happen to be, for whatever reason, on non-calcium-based binders, Cervelum or Lancinum, whatever it might be, they were allowed in the trial, but we weren't able, as per the protocol, at least for the six months of the trial, we did not allow those binder doses to be modified. And I don't, know if, I don't think this projects very well. I apologize. We assessed 132 patients for eligibility, we recruited, randomized 104 patients in about five months. So that was, to us, that was important because it showed that we can do this quickly. There's a lot of patients who meet the eligibility criteria, people who are generally willing. 53 patients in the intensive arm, um, uh, 51 patients in the liberalized arm. No patients were lost to follow up. Um, a few patients discontinued intervention, mostly it was because of death uh, or transplant. In some cases, it was because of a change in dialysis modality. But overall, a pretty smooth uh, functioning trial, at least for the six months that we uh, conducted it for. The blue curve here, um, or the curves here, show how calcium dosing changed over the 26-week uh, uh, trial period. Uh, at day zero, the median dose of calcium in both arms was 1,500 milligrams, again, in elemental calcium terms. That was about five extra cent Tums tablets or three tablets of calcium carbonate, 1,250. In the liberalized arm, very quickly, we were able to wean off uh, 
phosphate binders complete, such that by the end of the trial, the vast majority of patients in the liberalized arm were on no binder whatsoever. In the intensive arm, uh, the median dose of binder stayed approximately in the vicinity of 1,500 milligrams of calcium per day. What happened to the serum phosphate? Well, in the liberalized arm, as you might expect, it rose, but it didn't rise to crazy extent. Yes, there were patients who spiked to really high levels at various points, but the median phosphate in the liberalized arm was somewhere in the 1.95 millimole per region zone um, over the course of the trial and at the end. And the intensive arm, as we'd intended, and again, there was a lot of fluctuation, but the median um, phosphate, sorry, the mean phosphate concentration was about 1.45. So about a 0.5 millimole per liter separation between the two groups. Again, I want to emphasize that hyperphosphatemia, or so-called crazy hyperphosphatemia that a lot of people were worried about at the outset of this trial did not occur, by and large. So the conclusions of the target trial, again, a modest RCT, but we were able to show that recruiting a Canadian hemodialysis population to such a trial was indeed feasible. There was good adherence to the allocated therapies, severe hyperphosphatemia did not occur despite most patients in the liberalized arm being off binders altogether. So we've done the pilot, now we got have to go. Obviously that's not nearly enough evidence to make clinical decisions, it's only 100 patients, only six months follow-up. We need to do a large-scale definitive trial. And that's kind of where we are right now. Um, and we're going through this process of transitioning from pilot to main trial. And I want to share with you, at least, some of the key decision points that we have when moving to this main phase of our program. Number one, you know, when it comes to the setting and the patients that we choose, can we recruit enough patients to answer this question in Canada alone? Do we have to go beyond Canada to answer this question? Um, should we restrict the trial, as we did in the pilot, to patients that we thought were more or less going to be adherent, as compared to just letting everyone participate? Do we restrict it to hemodialysis patients who get blood work very frequently and are very easy to track, as compared to PD patients who come to clinic less often and have blood work less frequently? Um, in terms of the intervention, in our pilot, we focused on calcium carbonate um, and only phosphate binding, but should we really focus on binders or should we look at phosphate lowering in general when it comes to the intervention in the main phase of the trial? Are we going to allow the use of non-calcium-based binders, which again are fairly used fairly infrequently in Canada, but are used almost exclusively around the world outside of Canada? Uh, the other question, a really important mechanical question, is who will manage phosphate concentration in the main phase of the trial? In the pilot, things were fairly regulated. We had, you know, it was a small trial, but each center had a dedicated research coordinator. Uh, that individual looked at the patient's blood work every few weeks and said, okay, you've got to go up on your calcium, down on your calcium. It was all managed by the research team. But is this the right approach for a large-scale trial? Is this even feasible? Um, the other thing to consider is what will we do in the comparator group, the so-called liberalized phosphate control group? Will we gradually wean the binders or will we just abruptly discontinue them at the outset of the trial? And even though we did it for the pilot trial, and even though there was buy-in by clinicians of those five Canadian sites, okay, will clinicians be willing to allow phosphate to rise, sometimes to above 2.5 millimoles per liter, not just for a few weeks or a few months, but potentially for a longer period of time, uh, as the main phase of the trial will need to be conducted over a longer period of time, not just six months. And it's probable, or at least possible, that if we withdraw phosphate binders from patients with liberalized arm, that will cause dysregulation of other mineral met met metabolic parameters like parathyroid hormone. How will we manage that? Another important question, what will be our primary outcome? Should we do all-cause mortality or should we look at a composite of cardiovascular events? How do we integrate patient-reported outcomes? And who will adjudicate the outcome? So I don't have answers to all these questions, by the way. I'm just kind of taking you through the brainstorming that we're going through right now. Um, but again, I want to come back to the concept of patients being involved in choosing the outcomes that matter to them. Uh, the standardized um, uh, song group led by Alison Tong in Australia uh, was a network of patients and clinicians from around the world that came together a few years ago to talk about what are the outcomes that matter most to them in clinical trials. And this was specifically the subgroup of hemo the hemodialysis trials. And the core outcomes, um, it was kind of shaped like a kidney. So the I guess the, uh, the, the cortex here is, are the core outcomes, but the point is the core outcomes 
that people are really interested in are fatigue, cardiovascular disease, vascular access, and mortality. You can see in smaller fonts, things like phosphate are much less important to patients. So patients don't want a trial about surrogate outcomes. They want a trial about outcomes that really matter to them. The other thing that I think we have to be reflective about when designing clinical trials, our clinical trial and clinical trials in nephrology in general, is the issue of to what extent do dialysis trials reflect the dialysis population. This is a really, really important paper that just came out in JAMA Internal Medicine by Brendan Smythe and his group at the George Institute in Sydney, Australia. And they looked at 189 clinical trials done in the dialysis population, trials that were fairly large, they had at least 100 patients in them. And they compared it to uh, a cohort of prevalent dialysis patients drawn from the USRDS 2011. And they showed that by and large, patients enrolled in dialysis trials were younger, more likely to be male, but importantly, much less likely to have diabetes or hypertension as their cause of end-stage kidney disease. They were much less likely to have central venous catheters, and their mortality was much lower, implying that the patients that we are recruiting or that we have recruited into dialysis clinical trials may not be reflective of the actual patients that we look after every day. And we have to keep that in mind when we design this and other trials in dialysis. And this brings us to uh, kind of this dichotomy between what we call explanatory trials and pragmatic trials. Explanatory trials are relatively narrow. They're highly targeted uh, to a, a very select population. They're often done in academic health sciences centers with good research infrastructure, with a strict protocol, um, kind of like, in fact, our pilot trial in a way it was kind of explanatory. But, you know, to have trials that will become meaningful to our patients, we have to think more on the pragmatic end of the spectrum. We have to think of a broad eligibility, uh, not just recruiting patients at teaching hospitals like St. Paul's or St. Mike's, but think about community hospitals where so many patients uh, receive excellent dialysis care but are sometimes ignored uh, by uh, clinical trials. Protocols need to be relatively flexible to reflect what happens in usual care, and though it's nice to have a coordinator going to patients and telling them what to do all the time, the reality is that's not how the world works in, in our everyday practice. We, as clinicians, are the ones who manage our patients' phosphate, so perhaps in clinical trials, we should be the ones managing patients' phosphate based on the arm to which they're allocated. So with that, we're moving towards the main phase of our research program, moving from target to phosphate. So phosphate is a new um, acronym that our, our friends in Australia who, with whom we're collaborating came up with. I like it. Um, it's, uh, it stands for Pragmatic Randomized Trial of High or Standard Phosphate Targets in End-Stage Kidney Disease. And what is phosphate all about? So for starters, phosphate is a four-country collaboration between Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the UK, and hopefully more countries to come. It's an open-label, investigator-initiated, multinational pragmatic RCT comparing intensive versus liberalized phosphate control in patients on dialysis. And the fundamental question that we're asking is whether intensive phosphate lowering as compared to a liberalized approach, kind of similar to what we did in the pilot, does, it confer, does the intensive approach confer a lower risk of fatal and non-fatal major adverse cardiovascular events in end-stage kidney disease patients receiving dialysis? The inclusion criteria are, I think, fairly broad. We're looking for patients on hemodialysis or PD. We're including PD and phosphate for at least three months. We're looking for patients who are over 45 or, if they're diabetic, over 18. And they have to be in the receipt of at least one phosphate-lowering medication. This is because, clearly, at some point in the patient's history, a physician felt that they needed to be on a phosphate binder. If that's the case, then the research question applies to them. We're only excluding patients if they have an elective transplant that's scheduled, if it's felt to, they're felt to have a very high risk of dying in the next six months, or if they're participating in an interventional trial that might affect, in and of itself, phosphate concentration. In the intensive arm, we are going to tell clinicians to utilize routinely available labs only. We're not going to draw any extra labs in phosphate to target a serum phosphate of less than 1.5. In the liberalized arm, we are telling clinicians to stop all phosphate binders and only intervene with rescue therapy if the phosphate exceeds 2.5. How are we actually going to pull this off or try to pull this off? Um, again, as I said earlier, it's going to be clinician and not research coordinator implemented. 
In other words, all changes to the phosphate regimens will be done by clinicians. Sure, we're going to remind clinicians electronically and through other means if their patient's out of range for what they, based on the arm and the trial in which they are in, we will remind clinicians, make some suggestions of what they can do, but it'll be the clinician writing the orders, not the investigator, not the research coordinator. <coughs> all accessible phosphate binders can be used. This is largely because if we're going to take the trial outside of Canada, um, you, you would have to really broaden um, the phosphate binder availability, but we're not going to pay for phosphate binders. If whatever is accessible to patients is what will be used. Um, if clinicians want, they can intensify hemodialysis or escalate the dietary advice that patients get in the intensive arm that is completely up to clinicians. But again, I want to emphasize we are not going to do any extra blood work. I think our patients already get too much blood work, so we are not going to escalate blood work above the uh, blood work that's done in routine clinical care in order to achieve our phosphate target. So this is a, basically a broad overview of the trial. We're aiming to recruit 3,600 patients, 1,800 in each arm. Uh, and as I said earlier, our primary composite outcome uh, will be cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, stroke, coronary vascularization, or a peripheral arterial event. And we have a bunch of important secondary outcomes as well, including all-cause mortality, hospitalization, and markers of quality of life. And it's an event-driven trial, and to reach uh, our, um, our, our statistical uh, requirements, uh, we are going to wait until 1,190 events occur. So, again, this all sounds very good, especially when you put it on, a sl on slides, but we know this is going to be difficult. I have no um, illusions about that. I think there are a lot of limitations, some of which I'm going to mention here. Number one, many people might say, okay, well, you know, especially in your Canadian patients for whom only calcium is going to be available, um, are you going to, is this going to confound the results? Because maybe all the benefits of phosphate lowering are obliterated by our excessive and maybe dogmatic rigid use of calcium in most Canadian jurisdictions except for Quebec, where, which is the only Canadian province where you can get non-calcium-based binders, I think, relatively easily. Okay, are you Canadians going to ruin the trial because you don't have access to non-calcium-based binders? Um, it's great to say that we're going to rely on clinicians to manage serum phosphate targets, but is that going to work? Is a busy clinician really going to listen or, or respond to my email uh, begging him or her to focus on that patient's serum phosphate? Um, let's be honest, it's tough. We all have uh, kind of busy uh, lives, and it's not always going to be easy to do. It might be easier to have a coordinator or more effective to have a coordinator do this stuff. Um, we have an open-label design. And any time you have an open-label design, there's a risk of co-intervention, uh, an unbalanced co-intervention specifically. And so it really goes to the question is, it's great that we've designed a pragmatic trial, but will our trial be so pragmatic as to potentially obliterate our ability to see a difference in serum phosphate and therefore obliterate our ability to draw any definitive conclusions when the trial is done? These are things, important questions that we're going to think about and as the trial goes on. In terms of our progress to date, um, as I said, we did a pilot in Canada. There was a parallel pilot uh, done in the UK that both demonstrated the feasibility of comparing intensive versus liberalized phosphate control. We secured funding here in Canada, uh, thankfully through CIHR. The Australian colleagues that we have and the New Zealand colleagues have also secured national funding. We are putting an application through now in the UK, and hopefully that will be successful too. Um, we are very fortunate to be working with uh, the group of the Aust Australasian Kidney Trials Network in Brisbane. They will be the central coordinating center for the trial. Um, and uh, here in Canada, we are aiming to recruit 1,000 participants at at least 25 sites. Um, the coordination center for the trial in Canada will be at the Applied Health Research Center at downtown Toronto at St. Michael's Hospital. We have a Canadian leadership team, but we're always open uh, to uh, more people who want to join. We have patient representatives giving their perspective on how we can best uh, conduct the trial, and we are starting central REB applications in Ontario and Quebec. So we hope to actually start recruiting patients in the early part of 2020. So a few words of conclusion. Hopefully we can have some discussion at that point. Uh, I hope, I think you all, we all know that intensive phosphate control, the concept of intensive phosphate control is deeply entrenched in conventional practice despite and ab despite an absence of good evidence. Um, despite the potential conceivable benefits to patients, I think we have to appreciate that phosphate control or intensive phosphate control has real risks and comes at significant cost. 
And though I know that we all have a genuine desire to improve patient outcomes, perhaps by controlling their serum phosphate, we can't allow our emotion and our, and our, our gestalt and our gut feeling about phosphate to bypass the rational scientific process. And ultimately, what I really want to do today is make an appeal to you as colleagues in British Columbia to consider the phosphate trial. We can have more in-depth discussions about it afterwards and hopefully consider joining and making this a true kind of countrywide collaboration. So with that, I want to thank you very much. I want to, again, spend a few words of thank, thank, particular thanks to Mike Walsh, my co-PI, as well as our CIHR grant team, our international collaborators, the group at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, uh, which is really courting the trial centrally, and uh, again, open it up to some questions. Thank you so much. Um, just a, a quick question. What are your, and thank you for that, that was great. What are your measurables for um, quality of life in your study? So um, right now we'll be using the, the KDQOL um, and, and measuring it every six, uh, every six months is our aim. Measure it serially over the course of the trial. Well, what, what questions are you asking pa of patients? Like what are the, the parameters? I mean, is it, is it pruritus? Is it, what, what are right. they? So, uh, there's a separate, so there's actually we are, we're thinking in Australia they are going to have a specific scale looking at pruritus. Um, that we are also weighing whether we're going to include that here in Canada. So what we've done to make, again, the trial kind of pragmatic, there's a core protocol for the trial that every country has to follow, but then there's some secondary outcomes that could be selected in different countries. And, and um, the Australians, I don't know much about this scale, are going to use a, a, a pruritus scale over the course of the trial, which I think is a really important question. We're weighing it here. The only, I'm just kind of also worried about the burden of data collection. And so there's a lot of questions we want to ask, a lot of patient-reported outcomes that we want to address, but we're trying to weigh that. So, but I'd, I'd, be, I'd be open to, we're open, that's still on the drawing board. And she was asking that. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I, my only, my question was, um, if you're going to allow patients to have intensified dialysis, how are you going to tease out the benefits that you get with intensifying their dialysis with regards to salt, solute removal, like salt and fluid, and that improving the cardiovascular yeah. outcome. Um, so it's definitely uh, definitely an issue. I mean, I think we 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 try. I don't think you, I don't think you necessarily can. My, my own view is that very few people are going to have their in the intensive arm will have their will have their phosphate intensified, so to speak, or phosphate control intensified with intensification of dialysis because most people don't accept it or buy into it. I think what, what will the discussions that will happen is patients who are cutting sessions. We'll, we'll speak to them about, you know, at least staying for the four hours and coming three times a week. Um, but at the end, again, phosphate control is not just about binders. And so it, I guess to some extent, being a pragmatic trial, we're not so worried about what the mechanisms of phosphate, how we get there necessarily. We're just kind of interested in by getting to a low phosphate, is that actually helping patients overall? And um, although I think most of the lever will be binders at the end of the day, I think we have to appreciate that there's, you know, that even though there's important caveats, as you mentioned, I think allowing clinicians to at least give patients the option of intensifying dialysis is important. The patients that you've included to date, have you, have you included them in some of the trial design and some of the um, understanding? Because I think that one of the things we have learned is that when patients think it's a good study, they're actually very good at helping to recruit patients into the yeah. study. I agree. So we've, you know, we've engaged, I mean, it, just for convenience, uh, patients that I know well from Toronto. Um, you know, the, again, if I can say also that the, having patient involvement is, is super important. Yes, they can um, help promote the trial. The problem is sometimes the patients that um, we get involved in the trial planning process as patient partners aren't always representative of the dialysis population. And so some, they're, they're often um, unique because of their you know, perhaps level of sophistication, motivation, education, and things like that. So, but yes, I agree. We will definitely, you know, having the patients involved is vital and uh, we'll continue to do so. I, um, Nanaimo, do you guys have questions? I'm just sort of looking at who's... Hi, thank you very much. It's an excellent uh, and very welcome trial. Um, can I ask you that... Um, a number of years ago, there was an old adage that a third of these patients are not going to calcify, um, uh, and therefore, uh, potentially, 
is there any value in screening out those that are uh, are non-calcified from a, say, an aortic vascular point of view before starting the trial? Are they going to ruin the outcome of the trial or Okay. So, so is the question of, is that excluding patients or, or, or focusing our attention on patients? Sorry, there's just a code gray here. Sorry. That's a new code. I don't think we have that one in uh, in Toronto. I have to learn what that is. Okay, so the um, you know I, I think in, ideally um, it might be interesting to say well perhaps in patients who don't have a tendency to calcify those are the patients we should be interested in for a trial like this because you know it really just focuses on on phosphate control and perhaps the people might feel more comfortable about letting their phosphate concentrations uh, rise. I think that. That it might be difficult to recruit such a very limited population because I think we know that probably the majority of dialysis patients, depending on how you define calcification, have calcification. Um, and it would be, uh, I think it would be difficult to exclude those types of patients. The reality is when we make our decisions about phosphate binding, we don't necessarily, we look at the phosphate value. We don't necessarily look too much in depth about how, to what extent they're calcified. It might affect our decision about what binder we'll use. That's a possibility for sure. But we really just look at the phosphate concentration. And so in order to make the trial relevant to real life, we should use the triggers that we use in real life and everyday practice uh, to guide our management, namely the serum phosphate value, for, for better or worse, uh, to guide um, inclusion in this trial. Did you consider block randomization by center? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so there, there certainly will be um, uh, uh, randomization will be stratified by center. It will be in random blocks. Uh, that will be uh, unknown to the uh, investigators and, and all the key players on site, for sure. Any um, decisions or any instructions to investigators regarding uh, vitamin D use? Great question. I mean, I, I think it's so controversial and um, there's such a diversity of practice when it comes to both so-called nutritional vitamin D and activated vitamin D, what to do with this. Um, we are letting clinicians do what they want at the end, as we kind of did in the pilot. Um, just because it's so hard to provide good uh, data uh, and good guidance, we anticipate that hyperparathyroidism would, will be exacerbated in the liberalized arm, uh, and that might mean more uh, need or more, some clinicians may be more compelled then to use uh, sinicalcid or activated vitamin D. Um, we're letting clinicians do what they feel is right because we can't really tell them any definitively <laughs> what is the right thing to do, so we're letting that kind of fly. Interestingly, in the six months of the pilot, hyper, there wasn't some excessive hyperparathyroidism in the high phosphate group, although it was a relatively short period of follow-up. Um, on the topic of vitamin D, there is a trial ongoing now in the UK done by one of our collaborators here looking at nutritional vitamin D. It's called the Simplified Trial, so we'll have good answers soon about whether uh, ergocalciferol or cholecalciferol is useful in, in dialysis patients. So that will be a step forward for sure, but I don't see anything coming out soon about how to use activated vitamin D. Okay. Any questions at BGH? Hi, it's Nadia. Uh, great. I'm I'm just gonna come. Great, go uh, ahead. Thank you very much for that excellent talk and congratulations. Um, along the same lines as Abid's question, I'm just wondering, how does the availability of Sinecalcet differ between the countries? Um, I, to this, I, do, I don't know. I think Sinecalcet is generally much more widely available uh, in most jurisdictions, uh, at least participating in the trial that I mentioned, as compared to Canada. It kind of goes in parallel with non-calcium-based binders. In a way, we're outliers in the management of mineral metabolism in the worldwide dialysis community. I think, yeah, I think we, to some extent we should be proud of that uh, because if the evidence, you know, we shouldn't be paying for things that the evidence doesn't necessarily support. So uh, although people do look, yes, and although people, uh, I can tell you the colleagues in other parts of the world look at us very funny when we tell them about sending patients for parathyroidectomies and, and using calcium, I, uh, they think that we are practicing subpar medicine. I ask them how do they know that, that, uh, that that's the case and what basis do they have for that? That's, uh, Interesting discussion. Anyways, we're, we've kind of gone beyond that for the trial. And that, you know, we've just said use whatever agents you normally would for the clinical scenario 
in, in, as you would in usual practice in part, as part of the trial. The only thing we're affecting is, or we're trying to affect is phosphate control. And then we're trying to Hi. Go ahead. Hi, Adira. Hi. Sunit at, at UGH. Um, I think this is a really important trial because I think what happens, what seems to be happening in nephrology is we keep measuring more and more things. Almost everything we measure is abnormal and we keep trying to correct it to a normal state. Um, and we don't know whether that has any impact. And to start prioritizing a little bit, not only for patients' um, quality of life, but for actually like doing some things that are really important very well and not focusing on things that perhaps aren't as important. I'm just curious what you actually think the trial result is going to be. <laughs> um, See, I'm asking your bias. I, I, think, I think it's going to be neutral. I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm, not con I'm not convinced that phosphate lowering um, impacts on patient important events and cardiovascular events. And, I've, and over the years, as such, I've, even though I kind of was raised in a, in a culture at, at my hospital of <laughs> intensive phosphate lowering of patients having, in the days we used to serve um, food, um, you know, protein and, and dairy products were taken away from patients' food trays if their phosphate was high on monthly blood work. Um, I've, um, I've, I've significantly liberalized my practice um, because I just don't believe that uh, phosphate binding uh, leads to better patient outcomes. So that is my, that's where I stand, but I'm, 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 I'd be thrilled. I'd be thrilled to be proven wrong. Great. And I think that's, that's a really great place to end and a really good place to start the academic year. If we're talking about what do we do for patients that's meaningful and where do we put our energies, to be able to have a thoughtful conversation around the importance of phosphate and single values of, of one biochemical thing that's going to impact this complex biological process called cardiovascular disease, I think is you know, strangely naive as nephrologists. So David wanted to say. Can I just ask one, one yeah. quick question? Uh, so with the event, for, you said you needed all, uh, over 1,000 events. Yeah. How long are you projecting it'll take? I think what's, it'll, take, what's think the, it'll take three or four years. And that's the reason for international yeah. as well, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I think it's really great and very thought-provoking, and I think what we should try and do in BC is see what it would take for us to um, participate in this study, especially if it's very pragmatic and there's not a lot of extra burden of data collection. Uh, that would be terrific. So I really thank you for the thoughtfulness and also taking us through the process and helping us to really uh, think very clearly about all the things we don't know. Thank you. So appreciate it, Ron. That was great. That was a lot of yeah. fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. Like, it's always good. It's also nice when we have to put, I mean, I'm sure you put it together a lot. But it's still good. This is the first